the Educational Physics Podcast. Hi, welcome to the Educational Physics Podcast. This is episode number eight, and I am still João Figueiredo. It's been a while since I posted a podcast episode because, uh, you know, live. I'm writing a new book and I'm, of course, still running the Leeds Music Academy uh, and also a couple of other ventures, I guess. But that's besides the point. Today's episode was a really fun one. My guest was Klaus Levin. Klaus is a guitar teacher, he's an online instructor, he's got his own website with uh, courses and he really focuses a lot on mindset, practice, systems and the whole education idea, which is, of course, what interests me the most. Now, this episode unfortunately had a couple of issues in terms of uh, technology, but uh, we have to do the best we can with what we have. Our connection wasn't the best, and eventually uh, we really lost connection completely, so this podcast is, I guess, not complete. However, it's still almost an hour long, and... Here's my promise to you, we will do a part two soon so we can resume and conclude this podcast and this great conversation, which I hope you find as interesting as I did. So with no further ado, here's Klaus Levin. Thank you for, for saying yes, uh, I'm, I'm very uh, excited and curious to talk to you and discuss all things education. I um, Maybe I should start by saying how I came uh, across you. My Because I run a yeah. music school here in England and one of our guitar teachers told me, look, you've got a podcast, you got to talk to this guy. So he, <laughs> gave, he gave me your number, your number, your name. And uh, so I, then I looked you up on yeah. YouTube. And I guess we can start uh, the official podcast with me saying that I just saw um a video maybe you know last week or so um that you posted recently on how to stay super motivated to to practice so that was for me like okay i really got to talk to this guy <laughs> because that's my kind of um idea and philosophy behind teaching is really working the the mindset of the students and really help them uh, manage their own emotions during practice which is exactly what you talk about in that video yeah so um maybe we should start with you know for those people who don't know who you are especially my audience most of most of them are drummers uh so what's your okay. story like uh, tell me everything the yeah i'm curious <laughs> well I, I i i started playing guitar when i was 10 i actually started playing drums when i was nine and then i yeah from a, from a, an orchestra you know classically trained and and so he, he uh, I entered into a room with a big uh, fantastic uh, beautiful uh, drum set uh, it was red I remember it even and then uh, I was told to take two drumsticks and, and practice uh, reading the notes from the sheet and tapping that those that rhythm uh, you know puck 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 stuff like that you know, I, I think I went three times and then I gave up because that was just too much of a fr frustrating experience. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, my parents bought a, a practice set for me uh, that I could play in the living room, but that also just set puck when I hit it. So, so that wasn't really. So I started playing guitar instead, and then <clears throat> I was really, really motivated to do so because my father. T what I really wanted to play was the the laptop, uh, not the laptop, but the lap steel guitar from country, you know, that fretless wonder that makes those cool sounds in the background. And I, because I, just a lightning struck and I was just suddenly all into country music. <laughs> I have no idea why. I just like, oh, that's amazing. That was the, you know, that was the thing. And then I, I was like 10 years old, but I loved the, that style of music. And so I, I started to practice and I practiced with, you know, I was so into it. So I practiced a lot. To the degree to which people started saying, oh, he's so t talented. Aren't he talented? Because every time I showed up for, for to be taught, 
I just, I was so, you know, I played everything twice at twice the tempo that it was supposed to be playing because I practiced like a maniac because I wanted that lap steel guitar. And then pretty quickly, as I was practicing, I fell in love with the six string instead, the, the normal guitar. And, and uh, I stopped practicing so much. So I stopped being that talented. <laughs> and then, you know, nothing really went by. You know, I, I was taught for three years and then I went to high school and I saw a uh, video with Paul Gilbert. I saw his first instructional video because I had a classmate who played electric guitar. And I saw that and it was kind of it was my thing in high school that I could be that guy who could play guitar. So I discovered that that was a cool thing with the ladies and stuff. So so uh, I started looking more into it or being more motivated at that time. And then I saw this video with Paul Gilbert and that it totally clicked for me. It was like it was like an, an, an insanity uh, just appeared uh, suddenly. I was I because there was this guy. He showed me. This alien-like stuff he was playing that was over-the-top magical, like he was some kind of wizard who could do something superhuman, like Superman. Or, and then afterwards, he just said hi, and he was totally uh, a, 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 a cool person to be. And he taught me how to do it, and he showed me how to. So he brought that all the way to, uh, back to ground level after playing like the most incredible stuff. Um, and and I was just hooked. Uh, but, of course, that was a struggle. Learning alternate picking, which is a specific technique in guitar playing, that really takes takes some toll on you when it comes to how, how many repetitions you have to do to learn the patterns. Uh, but that became what I wanted to crack. And in that process, I went through all the stages of being frustrated, hopeless, uh, of putting in more effort, of... of questioning myself, all the self-doubt, all the I'm not good enough, I don't have the talent. And luckily, and this is the reason why I'm telling this basically, is that I have a dad who was also a teacher. He taught you, you know, normal school. And he, he had this idea that anybody can learn to do whatever they want. I don't know where he got it from, but e every time I came to my father with an excuse of how I couldn't, because the other guys, you know, I saw this guy, he practices half as much as I do, and he's twice as good as me. I really don't have, and then he just said, I'm sorry, but you can do it. I'm really sorry. I can't help you in your stories about how, but you can absolutely do it. You just need to figure out the right way and then put in some more practice. He wouldn't let me off the hook. He wouldn't say, oh, maybe you should try focusing on something else in your life. Absolutely not. So really, he just sent me back to into practicing because I really wanted it. And it there was no way out of it. There was no, no help from my father, who was my, you know, my hero at the time. And so I, you know, I got kids at a pretty early age. I was, you know, living as a musician, but then I started, you know, venturing into businesses and I dropped playing guitar for 10 years, actually, where I didn't almost didn't touch the instrument. And then suddenly one sunny day after having multiple businesses, the lightning struck again. And then I returned to it with, with a great deal of passion. But this time uh, I had a different focus and I started the, the, this, the business I have now which is 10 years ago um and and i it be, just became a mission to to teach people um because it's like when you're when when you've taken the as many people have when you've taken the journey i have towards trying to build skills that seem superhuman and the journey seemed impossible but then looking back on that journey and seeing if I had to do that again, I would just cut the, you know, I would just stop the frustration and all, all the anguish and pain. It just because now I know what it takes. So just do the thing and have fun in the process. It was a fun process, by the way. You know, the frustration and anguish didn't make it bad. bad but it's like anyone can do it, which, you know, it's just but because we because it's not in the culture, right, we get everything almost in. Instantly in this life, right? We instant gratification, and few things really require that amount of focus, and so we don't really we we think it's easy what to go back and do it again. I would just do it with, without all the frustration and question, I, and I would use the right practicing methods, of course, instead of but because most of my practicing was focused on finding the right way, the the most effective way. Um, 
and I succeeded and, and in, in many ways. And I took all those lessons to my lessons or the lessons I give today. And I took all those lessons that I have from, from psychology. I've been studying, uh, read hundreds of books in the areas uh, of psychology in all areas of life, basically. Um, and, and applied a great deal of knowledge like that to, to the process of learning. And, and it's like I cannot stop the notion. I can't, that's where my passion is. And I didn't choose that passion. It's just that when I hear somebody talk about their limitations, I go crazy inside. It's like, because it's like what, what the whole business is about, actually, or my, my work as a teacher is basically breaking out of mediocrity. Because we walk around like freaking geniuses. We're able to achieve the most incredible levels of skill. And, but we walk around as, you know, with his, his stories about how we cannot do it, how I'm limited, and I don't have the time. I have kids. I have children. I have work. I can't do this because of that. And it's all just excuses because it feels painful to want to reach out to something we, we think we cannot get. So we, we kill that pain by making up stories about why we can't get it. Instead of moving to remove that pain, moving towards what we want. And so we stay safe. We don't have to try and fail. We just stay in our little zone, as our safe zone, not trying, not practicing, not investing thousands of hours and then seeing no results. Because that's what we're most afraid of. What's, that's what the brain hates, right? It hates just squandering resources. And so we stay safe, keep going to work, you know, uh, developing a loop that we can live in where we do the same things over and over again and we never have that magic in our life we, that which everyone can create. And because I play guitar, because music and, and the instrument is what I do, that's, that's my area of focus. But really, when I'm standing and I'm teaching, that's the burning passion behind it is that I so want to take whoever is listening to that place of magic uh, and and I know they can, but you know it's and I know that you know it's a small percentage really that does it, and that's why I post videos every single day on YouTube. It's not because I get more subscribers from it because each and every video actually gets fewer views because there's so many of them, but that's because you know every single day I want people to get up to the fact that there he is again, the guy with you know encouraging words, and you know it's inspiration and methods and insights that make me believe that if I use those insights, if I use this new method, then maybe I can do it. That's all because we need something to counteract that doubt that everyone has because we live in a culture of mediocrity. Even Americans live in a culture of mediocrity, uh, even though they say they don't, but <laughs> you know, some say they don't, but where we strengthen that in ourselves, you know, the, the, the middle road. And, and if you want to break out of that, then you need something that doesn't come from the same place. And that's why I post so many videos, is to try and make that inspiration available for as long as people need it until they actually prove to themselves that, oh, of course I could do it. You know, so they become soldiers of, <laughs> of uh, extraordinaries when it comes to music, uh, <laughs> I hope. Uh, but, it, but yeah, so that's that's basically the story and why I do what I do. Um, yeah, yeah. There, there's a, a lot there that I uh, <laughs> there is that I would love to to unpack and discuss a little bit further. I mean, my my second uh, point here on my list uh, was going to to be uh, me asking you about your passion for education, as in where did it come from? Because often, yeah. uh, you know, most successful people. But let's uh, use musicians just to make it a bit more relatable, maybe. Um, you know, they have a passion for learning. But then there's a, a yeah. smaller percentage that has a passion for teaching those learnings, right? And that's that takes a different kind of person. And I've talked to a lot of people, and, you know, all of them, they seem to have a very clear moment in their lives when, you know, that teaching... Uh, that desire for sharing knowledge suddenly just appears. I mean, it might, might not be so sudden, but, but you get my point, right? Like there's something that happens in their lives that makes them go, you know what? I want to now pass it on. And, and uh, you are extremely passionate about that aspect. So I'm sure that, you know, 
Perhaps again, and I can totally relate to, to that experience because my parents, both of them actually, uh, were also teachers. So I can 100% understand the, you know, living with that, yeah. with that <laughs> mindset of like, no, no, you can learn everything you want. You just have to understand how you learn. You yeah. might, you might be knocking at the wrong door. <laughs> That's that's yeah. and that's something that I learned as well very early on. So, w where did your passion for education come from? I, I believe that I um, I was born with you know because everyone's born with certain character traits. We know that every parent know that their children are very different magically uh, without us really doing anything. And I believe that at that amount of, of because teaching is really leadership as i see it if you can't lead if you're not in you can you can you know you can transfer uh information out of your mouth or you can write down information give it to another person and then that's it but that's not really what it's about i think because if, if no emotional change has happened during learning then that's not really learning you just read it in a book for no 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 use of wasting another person's time a teacher's time if that teacher cannot you know cannot you know change your emotional state about what you're learning because that you know if you learn in a passionate state i know i'm all for a tangent here but if you learn passionately because wow you need you want this information and what you can do with this information is absolutely amazing then you learn at a hundred times the rate if you learn music theory from a perspective of how do i play the most amazing solos and you, you then, then you just garbage, you know, it's, it's ingrained in your brain instantly. But if you don't really care that much about it, maybe you have to learn this because you have to take the exam. And if the exam is, you know, then it's just, it's such a bore. And I, I hated school, like viciously hated it. And I still hate it when I think of it. I still, you know, in my, in my mind, I still hold long talks to the, a group of teachers when I went to school, how they wasted my time with no respect for the kids. And, you know, I'm really passionately angry at that system. And I don't know how to replace it with the, the given funds that we have today. But, but even so, so that's, a, that's really a, um, that's a passion there that comes from pain, that comes from spending, you know, hour after hour. I, I remember really when my math teacher came through the door at, nine, at ninth grade, I was so, that I just felt like, ah, oh, why haven't you ceased breathing yet? That was my, you know, honestly, that was how I felt. So, such a loathing of that situation. But because my father was a very passionate man around knowledge and, and, and you know, uh, philosophy and stuff like that, we have very passionate, I had very passionate talks with him then I didn't lose my, my, my passion about learning. And then I think I had kind of a talent for communicating. Um, and that's not to say that it's not a skill. Anyone can learn it. But I just, you know, you know I was in that pretty early on. And I just seemed to be, because I had this father who just told me that anything is possible constantly. When I, you know, met with other people who felt limited in some way, who thought they couldn't do it, who wasn't passionate because they couldn't, they really didn't really believe they could make a difference. They didn't believe they could do it. Then I just felt inspired immediately to convince them otherwise. And that's where it come from, I believe, that my upbringing and, and certain character traits that just, uh, because I remember in, in uh, what was it, the sixth grade, we had this assignment in school that we had to teach another student something that we knew how to do. And I did that. Uh, and it was a girl and I taught her some, you know, some dance moves, whatever. And afterwards he said, wow, you're really good at that. I mean, so I got this experience of another adult really being impressed with something I did that I hadn't practiced, but I just really basically mimicked my dad, who was all, always very expressive when he was teaching. So he always said, whenever, whenever I did something right, no matter what it is that he was trying to teach me, he always went, yes, that's it. You know, just so he almost scared me, right? So there was an immediate, yes, that's it, great. You know, and I just had to do something just approximately right for him to say that. So he was like, try, try it. Oh, no, I can't. Oh, try it. And then I said, see, I failed. Yeah, try again. Try it. Yes, that's it, he said, right? 
So it was, it was like really, uh, and I just mimicked that, uh, replicated that kind of way of really reinforcing whenever the student did something right. Uh, so I, I guess that's it's kind of a combination of those things. Um, and then I've been in sales for a lot of years, and, and that was basically the same story. Selling, teaching is selling, uh, from my perspective. Uh, but I don't know if I'm I already said too much or if I should go out that path. <laughs> well, it's uh, you can say whatever you want. It's a safe space. <laughs> uh, but um, so I want to go back to this idea of leadership because I use a different yeah. word, but I totally agree with you. I, I refer to it as mentorship, but I 100% yeah. understand what, where you're coming from. And I would like to, to then um, ask you, uh, because again, another common thread that seems to exist uh, between all these professional educators, not just musicians that I've interviewed, is that there's always a father figure, if not a father really, uh, that inspires them and that um, gives them, I guess, a very clear uh, understanding of how we work and then we can show other people how they can also tap into that learning how we learn, right? Which is my whole mission in life, right? Yeah. I, uh, my first book, I wrote, well, I'm writing the second book now. My first book was effectively called How Do We Learn? Which was all about, well, even before I say that, I wrote it because <laughs> I wanted to write a sort of, you know, booklet. It wasn't really intended to, to be a book at the time when I started writing okay. it, but to help my students. Right, just my private students. I didn't want to publish the book. That was an afterthought. But um, you, I just wanted to write a sort of manual that I could give my students, so they could, uh, you know, navigate the process of learning a little bit better. So then, eventually, I went on to publish that book. And now, my my second book is uh, again, and I'm saying this because you've mentioned these things. My second book is effectively uh, how to teach those who don't want to be taught, because like you. I also hate school, <laughs> so I, I have exactly the same uh, um, pet peeves with the education system, educational system, uh, how teachers, not all, but most of yeah. them uh, treat the students as these empty vessels and they just, uh, you know, pour the knowledge on them and, and then that's it. You go home and do the exam or whatever, right? You get your, your number, get your yeah. number. It's always about the number. I also hate that. So now I'm, I'm addressing that issue and this second book is exactly on, okay, but now let's teach those people, really teach those people who don't want to be taught because they've been traumatized by this system. And um, yeah. so it's all about uh, uh, how to approach that from a, uh, you know, a private uh, tutor standpoint, but it can be applied at scale as well, I guess. Yeah. Um, but what do you think... Well, I'll ask this differently. Do you think that the role of mentorship can be learned? In other words, let's say someone is passionate about teaching, yeah. but they don't really know what it is to be a mentor and how to develop those skills because it is slightly different, right? That role of leadership and mentorship, that's what makes a difference when it comes to effective teaching uh, in comparison to just sharing the material, like you said. Yeah. What do you think those important skills are in order to develop those leadership roles? I actually think like the most important thing is what happens inside of you. And that's the that's a tough thing. If you really want to go deep into it, like I, I once bought a book about how to bring up children and, and he spent like the two two first pages about about the children and then the rest was just about the parent. That that uh, I really think that you know you th you know mentoring is a lot like being a coach. You know you've been through all the hassles and all the stuff, and now you have that perspective, so you can look back and then help a student overcome the same challenges you have, and bring perspective to the to the game. And of course, at, to some degree, it's also again a matter of leadership. You have the skills that the student wants. Uh, so you become kind of a role model for that. Uh, and, but, but I really think that, you know, the, the guy I was brought to when I was supposed to learn how to play drums, uh, could have been the perfect teacher for another kind of ch child than me. 
but he was absolutely the wrong person for me. So I really believe that 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 p- people are very different, and there's not not one solution. But I think you need to really you need to pick your mentor based on your emotions about that. You, it's not it's not a mental game; it's an emotional game. It always is. So so that's the first. You, those two has to go together. You have to have the same kinds of character traits, so you can see yourself in your mentor and vice versa. Uh, was that the, the response you were looking for or some of it or am I going in the wrong direction? No, not at all. Uh, I mean, I share the same ideas. One of my, um, I guess the, the way I approach it is that uh, I believe that, uh, let's say I'm going to use this word a little bit loosely here and I have to be careful with how I'm interpreted here, but a real teacher, <laughs> and I yeah, mean right. this positively, but a real teacher is, is the one, like you said, who's able to adapt all the time. He's able, yeah. to, he or she is able to adapt to the student, to the situation, to the energy in the room. So, like one of my, one of the cha- chapters in my uh, new book is um, how to match the energy in, in the room unless it's a bad one, right? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. um, and how to manage exactly that emotional uh, aspect of teaching, right? So the student comes in the classroom. Because I teach mainly, uh, pri- well, I teach only privately and I teach mainly in person. So yeah. I deal a lot with these situations where I finish a drum, a drum lesson in my case and there's a great vibe in the room because that, that student is an extrovert and he, he was happy, was in a good mood. And now yeah. someone comes in and they just had a horrible week. Yeah. Right. And the, the, the energy shifts in a split yeah. second and the teacher can easily be thrown off by that because we are humans. I mean, we yeah. are conditioned by these things. But a, a mentor needs to be able to immediately, um, you know, or a, at least as quickly as possible, if not immediately, to sort out that situation, um, manage the energy, hopefully change it towards a positive uh, energy and a, a learning friendly energy and that's something that is incredibly difficult from a, even a, an emotional standpoint for us teachers right it's it's very exhausting it's very tiring and most people you know i guess we're well, going back to what you said at, at the beginning if they are not willing to go through that pain and now i'm referring yeah. to the teachers right if they're not yeah. willing to go through that pain of really putting everything out there in the name of teaching and the student, yeah. then they will not really be as su- as successful as a teacher as they could be. It's just like learning a musical instrument is learning how to teach. It's also painful. <laughs> it's a yeah, difficult it actually experience. It reminds me of the selling point again, that, that what you're doing there, there's a, there's a technique in NLP uh, that, that is called uh, uh, pacing and leading, where you, you would take that student, you would place yourself emotionally the same place as the student and then you would walk your walk your your way out of it gradually but that's exactly my point when it comes to teaching because what you're teaching that student is pretty it's it's just bits and bites of playing drums come on how complex is that but most people think that that's what it's about it's about okay i'm going to teach you how to do this and then i have my own little you know insights about how to play whatever it is that you're going to play about the techniques but basically you know, any idiot can read that off a book. That's tr- that's the that's the the hurtful truth. So, what you are doing in that situation? Why would people even come to a lesson? Right? You can pick up u- videos on YouTube. They need personal feedback, but most importantly, they need to. We need to take responsibility for the results the student gets. We need to say this student isn't practicing enough, or this student isn't taking. So, we need to be psychologists. We need to be experts when it comes to motivating and inspiring people you know as you said we need to we need to take part in what kind of student is this what kind of person is this? how does he needs to be taught you know it's a freaking science it's a much bigger job than most people really think of um and it's an emotional job as well right so so for instance when i'm teaching i'm uh, i'm selling i'm selling the course and the better I sell the course, the more motivated, the more enthusiastic people are when they start the actual process of going through the course. Then when the course starts, because I sold them the idea that you can take these techniques, these methods, and then you can create magic in your life on your instrument. And then they go ahead 
And in the first lesson, I have to sell them again of why they have to take the first lesson. What's in there? What will they get out of it? So I create the frame of the information that comes and what that information is about and what they're going to do with it. And then every point in the, every time I feel that because I see myself in them, even though I don't see them anywhere because I'm in front of a camera, I, I, I feel how it is to be the student. And I feel that, you know, this is going to be boring in a second. Can you still hear me? Yeah, okay. This is going to be, a, when I feel I'm talking a bit too much now, then I immediately feel the urge to start selling again because I need people to listen to what I'm talking about. And the only way they'll do that is because they think it's important to listen to me, right? Um, so, so it's really, it's a three-dimensional thing, teaching. But I would say, though, that I used to teach one-on-one, -on -one, and then I'd teach, but no one, you know, maybe one out of a hundred students had the kind of level of ambition that I had. So it was quite frustrating teaching students that were unmotivational bold. <laughs> it was like, I could just, you know, it was like trying to move a big rock. There was just no way. Um, and I tried to infuse them with all, you know, it was just, but then teaching online, then suddenly you reach, you know, hundreds of thousands of people and those who are like you, who respond to your teaching style, they gather around you. So they choose their mentor. And students who share the same uh, value system you have when it comes to practicing, they, they, they respond to the ideas you have, they respond to the emotions you have, and it's a totally different game, certainly. Um, and that's one of the, the great gifts of the internet when it comes to teaching that, that um, suddenly you have, you know, people who are like you uh, gather around you. And then what you say, that the information you have for them is so much more valuable because they are about to take the exact same journey as you because they are like you. Uh, and that, that's a different discipline. And it's a luxury, certainly, uh, of not having to struggle with students that are playing drums or guitar for reasons that aren't really, you know, the reasons that you perhaps uh, took up playing. Yeah, so, so, so mentoring becomes a different thing once you're, you're, you can reach that many people. Um, so, but again, I really think that it's a much bigger task. And, and uh, as you said, you, you need to constantly be evolving as a teacher and, and, and be you know, become better and better at the psych psychological aspects of it, the mentoring, the emotional part, and yeah, all of that. And, and that's what makes it so exciting, you know. No, it I is, think. and uh, it, it really is. And from like I always say, and I say this like because uh, I I have uh, you know uh, now m more than a dozen teachers working here for, at the music school, and I always remind them. We are teaching these students how to learn. We just so happen to use musical yeah. instruments as tools. Yeah, yeah. And I'm always reminding them, it is not about, um, you know, like you said, it, it's about the student, right? It's not about just, yeah. uh, here's the material, uh, now go home and practice. And I, yeah. always, and I say that to my students, I'm, I, I'm perhaps uh, too honest, and I, I'm just kidding, but <laughs> I'm, um, yeah. I'm, I'm always reminding them, look, if you go home and you don't have a why behind uh, th this exercise, so you mentioned earlier, right, yeah. if you go about learning music theory because then you can, uh, you know, crack the code of an incredible guitar solo, well, there's yeah. your why. If that's your mo motivation, yeah. Yeah, you are going to practice. So if you yeah. go home and you don't have a why, for sure, don't even grab a pair of sticks. Immediately no. send me an email and, and straight up ask me, like, uh, why should I do this again? <laughs> yeah. And if we yeah. can't find a reason, that's on me, the teacher. Yeah. Because then I've, yeah. I, I've given you something that is completely pointless. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, so you mentioned your online lessons, and I would like uh, to, to ask a little bit more about that because that's something that fascinates me um, yeah. as well. So when, when did you begin doing uh, online uh, tuition? Uh, about 10 years ago. Um, and I just basically started with the idea that I could create a blog site with videos on it. And then I would make, uh, you know, some money uh, from the traffic and having, uh, you know, ads on it from Google. 
and that would be the, the little because I wanted to do it full time uh, from the beginning. But then that didn't really work too well. <laughs> you don't make it enough. You have to have an inordinate amount of people on your website to have any kind of income from that. But and then I started creating courses and uh, everything was a struggle like anything else. Uh, it was a struggle. And in, in the beginning, I, I used a teleprompter because I couldn't really. And just the, the, the thing, you know, starting in, in talking to a camera, there's no students. It feels really awkward. You have to develop the ability to, to, not the ability really, but you have to develop that w where you go in front of the camera and the students are actually there. I'm actually talking to people when, I when I'm you know, talking to the camera. Um, and so much so that if I have to do an audio file, you know, just an audio recording, I can't just sit down and talk, talk it into my phone. I have to stand in front of the camera and then cut the video into audio because... Yeah, so, so, and you know, everything, video editing, uh, uh, you know, I did the, 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 the design, everything in the beginning. Um, but that was really, that's another journey that takes some time. And, you know, you have self doubt all the way, as <laughs> just with practicing guitar. Um, and, and then I started creating courses. As I said, I went back and forth, uh, having other jobs as my subscriber base grew. And then gradually I could make more and more. And then I made the shift years ago, a little bit too early, I think. I made the shift of doing it full time, a little bit too early. So I had no money for a couple of years, really. Uh, that was kind of stressful. Um, but then, yeah, then it's just if you do something, you, have, you create something of quality and you just keep on doing it, then uh, eventually... Um, it has so much momentum, you know, two become four and four people become eight and eight become 16. So there's an exponential growth. It doesn't feel like that in the beginning. It just feels like nothing's happening. Just what that, when you're practicing, gradually, um, you build momentum. And then there's this breaking point where suddenly, um, you're in another world, basically. Um, but it's, t it's taken like, you know, eight years to get there. Yeah, it's one of those uh, ten-year-long overnight successes, right? <laughs> everyone, yeah. everyone loves to see successful people as someone who's just been lucky, and one day they just had the, you know, the two hundred thousand yeah. likes or or views or whatever video, but they don't yeah. see the the ten years of just hard work. And for me, even more important that you mentioned there, that I really think that we should reinforce that idea to persist even when nothing is happening. And that's something that a lot of people um, can't really do. And I, I can't say that I don't get it. I understand the appeal of just like, ah, screw this. And no one's watching my stuff. <laughs> I'm yeah. going to stop doing it because it consumes yeah. hours of my day. Um, but, and yet those people like yourself, I can, I can sense that. And uh, I can speak for myself like me who, there seems to always be that call of duty, like always telling me, now I got to do another video. Even if no one watches it, I got to do it. <laughs> and I don't, yeah. I don't know what that is, but I definitely feel it. I don't know what that is, that sense of duty and responsibility. Um, but uh, I think that's what a lot of people really struggle with. They don't seem to have a sense of meaning behind what they do. They just go about their lives surviving. And that's uh, yeah. a shame. Yeah, it's a shame, but, but but I have a couple of thoughts about um, because because one thing the reason why we don't persist is that we we think that we should get rewards for whatever we do. We put in some work, and l let me see the reward now. And when the rewards stop coming, we go, okay, that's why we fall because self doubt is always there. We might think we can, and we can see the the the, the logic and why we can learn it. But there's always self-doubt because maybe I can't. I haven't seen it. I haven't felt it. So how would I know that I can do it? And because the culture is is the way it is, then as soon as when we get sufficient proof that we cannot do it, we believe that we cannot do it, and we're just basically the brain is just waiting for it because the brain hates to waste resources. It's basically not doing anything all day than to try and and just give each organ in the body the right amount of resources, not too much, not too little. So when you start you know, using tons of energy practicing and no results comes. It is, it's pure instinct to stop your activity because are you an idiot? 
like spending that much energy on nothing. And the brain is going to make sure that you start rationalizing and coming up with stories about how you can't do it. So you give up. But what 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 can um, work against that is first the knowledge that it is an exponential growth. You become exponentially better. The more things you learn and become better at, the more things you learn and become better at. And But the key is mastery. The key is pushing a little thing all the way to the top. Don't wait to become you know, the top drama, take one little simple rhythm or one little loop and then push it all the way to the top. Spend 50% of your time on just playing that relentlessly, insanely over and over again so, so, and push it all the way. So you prove to yourself that you can absolutely achieve mastery in anything. Most people practice a lot of things to the point of good. Then they lose interest and then they fall off the horse. You need to push something all the way to mastery. That's the first thing. The second thing is you need to be aware of the fact that even though it's an exponential growth, the actual curve of that goes up and down. So it's constantly being down, up, down, up. So so you get results one week, then you don't get the, the, the next. Then four weeks goes by, you have crazy results. Then another two months goes by, you have no results. And then so it just, and the, but if you watch it over a period of two years, you see, and you take the, the middle ground of everything, you see a curve that goes up like explosively in the end. But the experience of it on the way there is that, oh, I got results, then I don't. But we need to know that. So when it comes, the no results phase, then we oh, this is just part of it. This is just what happens. I just need to continue. And every single repetition we do of anything will actually pay off. We're programming the mind. And just because you don't get your cookie, little friend, doesn't mean that you're not absolutely training that pattern into your brain, whatever it is that you're practicing. And, you know, there's tons of things. You know, another thing is, how do you react to frustration? Just did a video about that today. Do you react like the warrior or do you react like the victim? Children react like victims to any adversity because they must. They are little defenseless creatures who need the help of others. When you, as an adult, react like a victim to frustration or adversity, you are basically acting like a little child. When frustration becomes something that spurs you on, so you just you become angry, you become mad, you just push even harder, you re redouble your efforts, you practice even harder, you, you go 10 steps back, start practicing stuff even slower than you can do it, right? And you just get stubborn. Then you react like a warrior to any, and then there's no stopping you. Absolutely nothing will, will be able to, there's no resistance that can take that. And I was lucky. Because my father wouldn't allow me to be a victim. He just sent me right back into the battlefield. And there was no choice. I couldn't escape. And I think we need that in a mentor. Just and totally, you know, you're not even willing to go in that direction. But maybe my fingers are too short. Maybe I just don't have that rhythm. You know, just never, don't discuss it. I don't want to hear that stupid talk. <laughs> All I want to hear is, how do we, where do we go from here? How can we push even harder? How can we, you know, learn even more effectively? Uh, and I, you know, but, but as you said before, the, the, one of the main roles of the teacher, the mentor, is to be able to catch a student in that, uh, in that when, when they get no results. Uh, and break that uh, hypnosis of maybe I can't do this. Uh, and again, that's why I do a video each day. Is you know because we need constant support. Now I yeah. agree with you. I agree with you, and those are all yeah. thoughts that I not only agree with, but I've I try to promote yeah. as much as possible. Uh, a few weeks, maybe months ago, I also yeah. posted a video called "The War of Life." And yeah. it, it was all about that, right? <laughs> this is not this is not a, a play. This is not an act. This is actual yeah. war. These are not rubber bullets. These are yep. actual bullets, and you will die <laughs> if you don't play this game right. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. And, and I talk about that kind of stuff all the time uh, because yeah. that's the truth. It takes one moment, sometimes, to condi condition the rest of your life, and then it's ripple effect. It, that's why people yeah. don't see it as actual punishment because they don't actually die in the moment; they no. start dying. <laughs> There's yeah. a, a process of a forty-year-long death. They, ju yeah. they just give up and then they look yeah. back and they are 70 years old and they go like, oh, only if I had fill the blank. 
right? It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a, yeah. a lifetime of regret, and uh, yeah. it's it's painful to watch, man. But uh, I totally agree with you. It's definitely the way of the warrior is the way to go when it comes to mastery. And and I say to my students, I actually I have a. I have that printed uh, like on one of my walls here that says like uh, the bridge between passion and rewards is knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only way you're going to go from one to the next. You got to yeah. learn. Cool. <laughs> yeah. But it's actually, if you could say one thing, um, because that, that just encapsulate the whole thing. It's like taking the indirect approach because that's what you, you're doing. Uh, about you know when you say to people or to your to teachers at the school that we're not here to, to teach we're here to teach them how to learn right you take a step back and say if you can focus on that then they can learn anything and the, the same thing goes here right that if you're focused on getting results i want to learn to play faster i want to learn that rhythm and i haven't gotten results then you're just you're too vulnerable you need to take one step back and focus on the activities instead you need to say okay what are my results this week? Well, the results are I did that many repetitions of that pattern. Or my results are I got up, I practiced five times a day, or I, whatever it is, right? Or I focused in that way. Or uh, I, you know, I ate, you know, in a cool, in a good way. I, I exercised, so my brain is just alert when I, whatever activity measures you have, those are the ones you focus on. And then you focus on your results once a month. You measure yourself, you focus on the results once a month. Instead of, making yourself crazy by asking, are we there yet? Are we there yet? You know, every single moment. So don't evaluate all the time. Take two steps back, use the indirect approach and focus on the activities that's going to get to where you want to go. And the activities being not only what you do to practice, but also how clever are you on how to learn how to practice? You know, are you, are you looking into new methods? Are you looking into the psychology of things of how to learn even faster? Because that's where the inspiration comes. Every time you find a new way of learning or you find an insight, the belief that you can do it just increases explosively because, oh, what if I do this? Oh, what if I try this method, right? And then you're all into it again. So, and if you're focused there, you're constantly inspired, you're constantly winning because you're focused on activities and those are easy, right? But so, 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 uh, yeah, so it's basically we're very, we're, we agree on so many things here. <laughs> we, we really do, which uh, leads me to the next question, which I'm super curious about. And I'll tell you why. Uh, so far, I've spoken mainly, uh, let me think here. I think I've had one guest so far who's from Europe. Everyone else has been uh, American uh, musicians, yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, for reasons of uh, that's just a law of odds, I guess. But yeah. um, so I'm very curious to see now the Scandinavian uh, uh, angle to this, because the next question that I have here is what do you think the current state of education is and what do you what do you think the future uh, lies ahead of us? Uh, do you mean formal education? What's the state? Yeah, we can talk about, I guess, uh, both, right? We can talk about the state of education as a whole, because as yeah. private teachers and online teachers, we have to deal with what, uh, let's call it normal education or formal education uh, also does to our students. But also, you let, let's also talk about, you know, online education and, and its future. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think the uh, knowledge and insights about T teaching and learning is is moving relatively rapidly actually uh if you look back 20 30 years ago then there are a lot of new things happening and that's positive but i think if you look at the you know formal education schools in general uh i i think that we're we're just totally because we're so focused on a a, a specific um uh, you know a specific uh, what do you call it, uh, you know, group of stuff you have to learn in, in schools. We have, okay, these are the things you need to learn in order to, you know, be a citizen in our, in our society. And then we learn that, step one, step two, and then we go through the curriculum. And I think that that whole process is just ridiculous uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't really, but but the, the alternative is also hard to implement. Um, but, I, but just look at me, I had never had any, you know, uh, reasons not to learn what I know today, but it was just made so. Uh, I remember my daughter said that I have had many subjects. I was interested. She's uh, grown up now, 
at many subjects she was interested in. But every time she took a course in a in a formal school or a university, you just say they killed it. They just I went into the class, five, ten minutes went by, and the subject was just dead. Right? It's like you know, we just have this, okay, here we got we got 20, 30, 40 students in a classroom, and then we have this teacher who believes that teaching is about, you know, bringing information from him to the students. We can do that on YouTube. We can do that in a book, in a, on a computer. You don't need to, to be, to care about that. We need your unique experiences, your passion, your enthusiasm around this. Um, that's what we need. <laughs> but, but so... But so I think this, if you look in schools, I can't really, you know, I still have uh, smaller kids. And when I'm at, you know, meetings in the schools they go to, then just when teachers talk, I just immediately go, oh, my God, the tempo that you're used to, like the, the, the amount of information that crosses from you to the people you teach or inform, is just, it's, it's just slow as, as heck. It's amazing. And I really think that the formal education, universities, and schools in general are just dinosaurs. But I, but I'm not, you know, I, I wouldn't know what to do if I had to reform the whole thing. But I think we're too, we're too crammed up about and too focused on. Oh my God, these students has to, they has to have to learn X, Y, and C. And if they don't, they can't have a normal life. They totally uh, overestimate their importance and totally underestimate the power of each child and what they can do by themselves. So I would say, you know, go learn about that and, you know, go learn whatever you feel like. You have to learn something, but just go learn, right? Because many of the things I was taught in, in public school, I could have learned in two weeks, four weeks, two months, to, if I was really passionate about them. I remember in high school, I never listened. I practiced guitar all the time, so I was always, you know, dead tired. Went to bed at three o'clock in the night, and then I was tired during the day, slept when I went home, and then practiced during the night again. Um... So when I had to, you know, go to the exams, I just have to, you know, learn everything in a very short period of time. And I, I remember being suddenly all fired up about ancient Greece, you know, the, the ancient Romans and all of that. So I really got into Homer or Homer. And I, I was just fascinated suddenly about the fact that they had such insights, you know, 2,000, 3,000 years ago. And, and that passion just drove me to read like passionately for four weeks. And I went up to the exam and I got the highest grade available. Uh, and, and that was just a, you know, just so amazing that I could get that kind of grade in four weeks when I was passionate about it, rather than trying to absorb that knowledge in a state. And I think that there's, it's just a, it's a disaster, the established system, uh, because they actually teach kids that it's, in most kids, that it's awful to learn, that school is, and, and the assumption that when you go out of school, when you finish school, then you don't have to learn anymore. I mean, what a mistake to make, right? Uh, so I really think that we should set everything free, and they should say, okay, what do you want to learn? You can learn anything. You just have to learn something, and we're here for you to guide you and to teach you how to learn. And then if some, some students don't really learn that much in any area, then maybe they should be, you know, <laughs> start life with less learning than other. I really, but that really requires you to be very confident about what each child really contains. Uh, I think we're arrogant in, our, in the way we, we look at students. But, but I don't know. So I really think the state is not very good. It's a huge super tango of a ship that is really hard to turn around. But when it comes to the, if, if you can inspire people to learn, then this is a crazy time where you have so much information, so many great communicators out there. And you can listen to books. You can read two books a week easily just by commuting to and from work. And when you do the dishes, it's amazing. that That's just, it's such a magical time when it comes to getting better at anything. And that's what's great, really. Uh, so, so if we can inspire people to learn, then there's no end to what you can learn to do and how many areas of life you can improve. And <laughs> so, 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 so the state of that, of learning in general, is amazing, I think, right now. Uh, but the established system is like entering into a church, you know, a, what do you call that? A graveyard, basically. That's how I feel anyway. And I know some people might feel provoked by that, but I don't care. No, and, uh, and you shouldn't care because it's the uh, truth. <laughs> <laughs>
the Educational Physics Podcast. And that's unfortunately where our podcast ended. We shall continue this and hopefully resume this conversation as soon as possible because I personally was having a blast. Now, if you're listening to this podcast on YouTube, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. Leave a like, leave a comment, do the share. You know the drill. If you're listening to this on iTunes, please subscribe to our iTunes channel. Uh, and of course, leave a five-star rating if that's what you think it's worth. Thank you for listening. Take care.